Water. Big you know, thing water. of water. Good evening, everyone. I've got a cold. <laughs> yes, and we were talking sausages. Sausages and chili and all sorts of stuff going on. We That's decided that that Jared will will open his own restaurant. <laughs> we've already trademark. We've already trademarked the the name the name of the special food that only he can make. <laughs> You're all invited to to come to his restaurant when he, for the grand opening. When's it going to be? <laughs> we'll have to see. I got some new buttons this week. Mm -hmm. For you your new uh, these are for um, probably. Let's see. I can't even see them. They've got little skulls in the center of them. Ooh, pirate skulls. What it was was um, I went to Mocha Fest on mm -hmm. Sunday. Hello, Tit Goblin. Hello, Undead Queen. What's up? For the first time, I went to Mocha Fest. Uh, with school, I was representing Pratt, the A A A S A O S A S S program, um, and my new coat wasn't ready yet, so I decided to wear. I have another painted coat that's part of a zoot suit, hmm. Hmm. which I painted back in sort of the aughts. I painted a little more. I, I can't tell you the exact year I painted it. I have to look up because I painted it like over three or four years. I used to like to go down to the village Halloween parade and I'd take pictures around the parade. Well, um, so I said, I may as well have a costume to wear. So I bought a zoot suit and, and not a Halloween costume zoot suit, an actual suit zoot suit. I think it's Italian. And then I painted it. Uh, and then I haven't gone to the Halloween parade in, I don't know, 15 years. So it's just been hanging in my, closet and so i said you know what i'll wear the coat from that to mocha fest i wanted to wear a painted coat so i did that except it's got these big buttons on them that kind of i don't i don't know enough about uh sewing to uh know it, it, they're they're sort of these big buttons where um like these where they're hung on by a bunch of thread and then there's a bunch of thread wrapped around that thread sort of like a coiled rope right um, almost like they're almost like they're nailed i think yeah but one of them was and i've sewn them back on before over the years but one of them was hanging off sure enough i lost it during the day hmm. so i was like you know what and and then I was like, ah, I'm never going to be able to find. And, and they're like, they're, they're these big, like, fabric colored buttons that I painted yellow as part of the suit. Well, one of my students was like, oh, this is your opportunity to get new buttons and make them all asymmetrical. And I was like, ooh, good idea. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I need buttons with skulls on them. <laughs> I don't know why that popped into my head. So I went on to eBay and looked up buttons with skull. I wish the button itself was skull shaped. That would be cool. But found these buttons with skulls on them. So now I'm gonna paint. Uh, I'm gonna put one of those on that zoot suit. And I was trying to decide if I now wanted to replace all the buttons with skull buttons, or just replace them one at a time as they all fall off eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what what can we, as a visitor, what can we expect from Mocha? <laughs> Mocha. Good evening, sleepy reader. Mocha is um, the Museum of Comics and Cartoon Arts Festival. Mm -hmm. It's run by the Society of Illustrators now. I think it used to be its own thing. Um, how did I manage to get a thumbs up by going like this you, down here? No, you you have the the, the thumb. You 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 were having the the thumb like this. Oh, yeah. like that. I, I somehow yeah. had it like that. And it gave me a thumbs up. Um, it's very indie. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, a lot of really indie people there. It's, it's as much an art fest, an indie sort of art fest, as a comic fest. So you see a lot of people there selling comics, books, stickers. There's a lot of schools there too. Uh, Scad was there. That's the Savannah Comic School. Um, 
Wilson's alma mater, the High School of Art and Design, uh, Montclair State, FIT. Uh, I was there with Pratt. They were there for the first time. Um, I think the School of Visual Arts was there too. So there's a lot of schools there showing off stuff. It's down on 18th Street between 6th and 7th. Forget the name of the place it's at. But you go there and the, it's like indie fest galore. There's just tons and tons of indie stuff, indie publishers. I got three uh, uncivilized books was there. <laughs> Who is who I got what I got um the sickness, the subscription from, and um what was the other one? Uh ginseng roots. And one other book that I that I forget the name of that I got when I ordered the ginseng roots books I was missing. But they, the, there's just a there's a ton of indie art and indie books and indie comics, guys selling prints and what not your usual sort of superhero comic book fest at all i once had a skull with buttons on it oh, old plastic forensics training skull covered in buttons says tit goblin sleepy readers do they have an actual museum or is that aspirational i think they used to i don't know if they did do any more <laughs> hey they're running on ethanol says missing mars <laughs> um I think they used to. I don't know if they do now. Uh, but the Society of Illustrators has an actual building with a museum in it. And it was like uh, Mocha Fest used to be, I guess, their own entity. Then I think the Society of Illustrators bought them 10 years ago, maybe. Or, you know, I, I, th I think Mocha Fest may have been going under. And the Society of Illustrators said, hey, we can make it work. So they merged or they bought or something. But the Society of Illustrators has been around for 100 years since illustrators were rock stars. <laughs> now they're being replaced by AI. Yeah. I'm here, bud. <laughs> but like uh, one of the books I, I'll show you. Um... Oh, I have to ask uh, Paolo how to pronounce this name. Mm -hmm. I should have asked her since she was there. I got Evil I See by. Okay. okay, so that's a Turkish name. And it's pronounced sort of Özü um, uh, Yeah. Wow. It's, it, it, it's weird like Turkish, yeah. O Z G E with an umlaut over the O. I was like, yeah. I don't know. Özü. <laughs> Yeah, but some, she said um, it was a murder mystery. Mm -hmm. Let me show you some of the art inside. I liked the art inside. Mm -hmm. I haven't yeah, read it yet, of course. Where's that? Let's see if it says a little something in the back. Evil Eyes is set in contemporary Istanbul against the backdrop of upcoming elections. The story captivates the reader with vivid descriptions and the author's precise power of observation that is less about politics and more about socio-political challenges, especially those faced by young women in a classically patriarchal culture, which Özgü describes with deadpan humor that's by uli lust today is the last day of the rest of your life u l l i you, you, don't, she was you, don't, there. you don't pronounce the g you swallow the g you swallow Oz, Ozi. 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 yeah because that that's when i when i, fi I finally heard uh how to pronounce Erdogan's name, the, the Turkish president? It's Erdogan. Ah. So, so yeah, it, it checked, in the, and the, you'll notice that the uh, I in her in her last name doesn't ha uh, is not dotted. That's because oh. they have two eyes, a dotted I and an undotted I. In the ah. in the undotted I, the the dotted I is pronounced E. The undotted I is pronounced 
E. E. Oh, e. interesting. So, so, so Samanji. Samanji. Interesting. That's a tongue twister. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a video showing off French collected edition of Bad Ideas, Eye of Odin, that was selling hot, like hotcakes at Angoulême. <laughs> Angoulême. 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 Oh, man, I that really one, can't. I really can't that pronounce one, anything with this cold. I just got phlegm in yeah, there that yeah. wrecks everything. And Angoulême is supposed to have a, a, a hat over the first E. Uh, but you, 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 your English language uh, keyboards can't uh, can't write <laughs> no. accident characters. <laughs> Evening sixty two lefty blues, <laughs> Damien. But I don't think there's a collected edition in English. Thanks, bad idea. Yeah, there is no collected edition in English. Yes, yeah, but right there's now. no point in there. There would be no point in doing an uncollected edition in French. <laughs> <laughs> lefty. Yeah, but yeah, look forward. I I had I had a lot of fun at Mocha, uh, hanging with the students. I was um, I also got to hang out with Dean Haspiel. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen Dean in twenty years in person. Oh, really, really, not in the last time I think I actually saw him was I was still at Marvel, and Marvel was in 40th Street. That's the only reason I know the date, right around two thousand and four. I don't think I've actually physically seen him since then i was just like whoa but you know buying his work and seeing him on facebook but have not seen him in person i don't think i've seen him at any con since then i was trying to think but it was fun talking to him you know it's like not a day has passed since we saw each other last <laughs> <laughs> he was selling could, his kickstarter yeah, stuff could, there you could talk about the good old days uh back in the war <laughs> <laughs> He hasn't slept could, in 24 years. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it could, he could come on and, and, and he'd be willing to talk about it, about his stuff? I'll have to ask him. I'm sure he will. He's trying to sell some comics. <laughs> it's nice you hang with the students. They can make a big difference. Yeah. And, my, um, and I got to talk to other young people, too. That My, my jacket was a real uh, attractor to people coming up. Because of my, my painted zoot suit jacket I was wearing that really made people come up and chat. <laughs> Tit Goblin says the cartooning art style from the sam example you showed, it has variations, but it's the graphic novel from the last 15 years, mostly showing up in all ages work styles. Does that have an actual name? I don't think so. I, I don't know what to call it if it has an actual name. I can't describe what I'm getting at. Yeah, simple cartooning, simple sort of young adult aimed cartooning by people who aren't influenced by superhero comics. That's what's different about it to us. There's like no superhero comic influence in it. It's all something else. I don't, don't know what to call it. But yeah, I know what you mean. But yeah, it's fun talking to people at the con, especially there's a lot of young people at Mocha. There's a lot of people late teens, early 20s, I noticed, walking around. And a lot of them look like art students or maybe going to be art students. Uh, you know, Oswald's Oswald style. Uh, it, it's not very different from a from a from a, a Portuguese artist uh, who is also who is also a woman, and she also has the the storytelling is a little bit different. But the figure drawing and the and the use of shadows, uh, it's kind of similar. Her name is Mozzie, uh, and she also you know, she likes doing slice of life stuff. Uh, but you know. More like uh, idyllic, idyllic stuff, uh, real world, idyllic real world, more more set a, in a outside of urban environments. Some nice dancing going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the undead queen. That jacket is thinking outside the box, very outsider <laughs> art world. Yeah. Well, I paint. Uh, um, since I painted my 
I got the new got the new duster this year and painted that. And then I've been painting the short one, the blazer. I I I've just I was enjoying wearing a painted jacket again so much when I had that duster when I was commuting. Because commuting is so boring. <laughs> And people actually will say, I like your coat, as or, or they'll interact with you during the commute if you got a fun jacket on. Um, so I, I wanted to paint the, the, the spring one, too. That's what I've been doing. So, and I said, and I was like, you know what? I should wear this to the con. <laughs> and that really got people talking to me and could talk to them about uh, what was going on. At the AAS AOS program. <laughs> Did the students get their start with Dogman and Captain Underpants by Dav Hilke? Um, I'm not sure. Some of them some of them are into comics, some of them aren't. They're more, more into illustration. A lot of uh, though I have to say, uh have Paolo, have you read um Art School Confidential. Never heard of um, Daniel Klaus. Mm -hmm. It's Daniel Klaus from 8-Ball. It's a little like five-page story that came in like, I don't even know, 8-Ball number four. They get, they made a movie out of it, but the movie, you know, had barely any resemblance to the comic. Mm -hmm. But what it was was it was like a four or five-page comic where Daniel Klaus blows the lid off of the greatest scam of the 20th century, art school. And Daniel Klaus <laughs> went to uh, Pratt, Brooklyn in the 80s. So it, it was mostly about his experience of Pratt. And, and at one point, he, he goes through all the different types of art students that were at Pratt. Uh, and th this was all of us, you know, in the early 90s at Marvel loved this four page comic because we all went to art school and we all recognized uh, the, the archetype. But one of the archetypes at art school was the guy who thinks the answer to every problem is a barbarian painting. <laughs> and sure enough, that archetype lives on. Except for it's not guy anymore. It's man, uh, guys and girls. And it's not barbarian painting anymore. It's manga drawing. So there's actually a lot of art students influenced by uh, manga and anime. And I would say that might be the biggest influence. I mean, maybe it's only a quarter of the whole students. But that quarter makes up a bigger influence than I think any other one thing. And there are some students who, no matter what, make a you know manga style drawing. Because that's matter of fact, I was um before I was even teaching, I used to go into my friend Ed's class and he'd bring me in and have me guest lecture them. And so this was at Montclair State. I was given a guest lecture. Then afterwards, some of the students would bring me up their work. And I would critique it. And there was this one girl who was like, oh, my, she was so frustrated with her own work. And the reason she was so frustrated with her own work is because she was so good at manga drawing that that's all she could do. Because I was looking, she's like, oh, I'm trying to, it, it was, it was funny because she's like, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that, but I can never do it. I'm like, and I looked at her work, and she had that like manga, it's sort of a generic manga style down pat. She could do it flat, but that's not, you know, that doesn't suit every single thing. <laughs> but she didn't know how to draw any other way. And I was like, all right, you gotta, you gotta start over. I was like, you know how to do this stuff cold. You gotta not do it. You gotta go back to doing bad drawing. To learn something else, mm -hmm. she's like ah, but I was like I was like I can see she was she was so frustrated because she reached the limit of what you can express yourself with with that particular style. So I found that in but yeah, manga drawing I would say you know manga and anime is probably the biggest influence on my students that I've seen. The 
I, I do find it surprising that they they go to manga immediately and and, and don't have a hello. I mean, oh, do we lose Palo? I think his ethanol ran out. Well, let's, oh, he's cutting in and out. Let's see what other people are saying. Damn it. Dick Goblin says, where do you think that style originated? Like, is everyone influenced by one person? Oh, you're back, Palo? Almost. I saw you move slightly. Just appeared in this everywhere now, it seems. Um, I'm not sure where that style originated. Uh, are you here again, Palo? He keeps moving, but not speaking. I am not sure where exactly this style originated, but I think it originated with the sort of just get it done school of thinking. Where, because it's not a style that's particularly precise or... Um, labored over so i think it's just let's tell a story let's get it done let's keep it simple and i think that style develops out of that but i'm not 100 percent sure but the other indie style i've noticed is the what i call the david mazzichelli style and of a lot of indie books you here with us yet Paolo? i can see him moving <laughs> I get it. I wear punk metal battle jackets and vest. Cool. Am I back? You're back. I can hear you. I'm not Daniel back. Klaus wrote the screenplay for Ghost World and Art School Confidential, which is a hilarious movie. I watched Art School Confidential last year for the first time since it came out. And I liked it better when I watched it last year than when I first saw it and i knew i'd like it better because the first time i saw art school confidential it annoyed me that it was nothing like the comic are you here with us palo well he was back for a moment <laughs> the manga influence has creeped into yeah it's everywhere now manga came yeah it's weird because the manga came from disney Old Disney. Ozama with Astro Boys where manga got a lot of its look. Yeah, and, and he got a lot of that from Disney. Early manga kind of ate Disney's third, yeah. And then came back to us. Say something, Paolo. I keeps moving in and out tonight. We'll have to see if he can come back. Hmm. Hmm. Curious. Let's go with some balloons. There we go. That'll entertain us for a moment. Oh, he dropped out. He's probably coming back. I'm going to reboot my router. All right, he's going to reboot his router. Ba, 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 ba. Here's an interesting thing I got at Manga Fest. This is a mini comic that um, there is a friend of mine from the bullpen who has been teaching at the Joe Cupert School of Cartooning for a while. His name is Michael Kreger. He also did a comic for Dark Horse, which I think there was only one issue of, plus that appeared in Dark Horse Presents back in the late 80s, called Zone, The Zone. Um, then he moved on and worked at the Marvel bullpen for a while. One of his students is named Jesse March, who coincidentally watches my weekly pull list. Polls. Jesse March, no relation to the Tarzan artist, but this is his... Uh, mini comic zine that he gave me a copy of 
there's a whole bunch of people. I guess there's a lot of his fellow Cuba. Hey, there's a uh, Astro Boy we were just mentioning. Uh, Manga in Me by Craiger. Look at that. He's got some of Craiger's work in here too. <laughs> Besides that, I'm not sure if I pronounce it manga or manga. There's a little self-portrait by one Michael Craiger. But I got to talk to him at uh, Mocha Fest. So it was nice to uh, five minutes to live. I really haven't got, being that I've had this cold, I really haven't had a chance to go through this. But it also comes with a poster in the minute, middle. But I thought that was cool. December 2023, manga anime. Let's see, does it tell you where to get this? Editors by J Jesse Marsh, 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 and River Porter. Interviews. Kubert Schools, Justin Prokovich. Look at that. Again, interviews in the back, too. Lots of fun stuff. The manga aesthetic is hard on my old brain. Were you happy with the Batman Treasury facsimile? Does the Adams art hold up? I think it does. Here's um that. The Batman facsimile treasury edition I got. $15. Didn't seem like too bad a price on it either. I think it was printed real nicely. It's got Irv Novik as part of the story. I think there's Irv Novik right here. And Neil Adams here. But I'll tell you what didn't hold up, because it never held up before, was the writing. I was never a fan of... 70s DC Comics writing, and that includes Denny O'Neill's Batman. And there's too many goofy things in here that always bothered me as a kid and still bother me. Like, um, ba Batman, oh, here, let me show you. shirtless Batman still wearing his mask always made me go, What? There's shirtless Batman still wearing his mask, kissing Talia al Ghul. That always made me go, what? And earlier on, and we and we have silly stuff like um, Batman fighting a leopard. Where is that? It's like Batman fighting a leopard. And he, and he beats the leopard by, I don't even know how. It makes no sense. It makes no sense that Batman can beat up a leopard. Hello there, Paolo. Hey, my bad, Con. I'm still hearing I, everything in hiccups. I can hear you. Can you hear me? No. Huh. That is weird. I don't think I'm muted. As far as I know, my sound is okay. <laughs> Paolo Reboot. What was the first multiverse Batman story? Never for any of those JSA, JLA team-ups. But the, the Neil Adams art is real good in this. The story is just as ridiculous as ever. It's just not very... It, Batman outside of Gotham City doesn't work for me. He just seems silly outside. He's go. He's traveling through the Himalayas. Batman on skis. Do we really need Batman on skis? 
I don't think so. So I I I find the story way too silly in this to enjoy, but the art is terrific. Was my uh, Asamu Tezuka was my early world of cartoons. It was Leo the Lion. <laughs> I fear if I went to art school now, I'd be the archetype of old weird guy that takes it all too seriously, and the 20-year-olds in the class will have no, no idea why the 40-year-old is there. Oh, yeah, that could be it. <laughs> I think I think one of the archetypes of in um in the eight ball Dan Klaus thing was mom. The older woman who was in class just for the heck of it. I like it, Damien. The oversized Adams art is great. Yeah, I I really the, the art, even the Irv Novik art is nice to look at at this size. But like I said, the story to me doesn't doesn't hold up. I, I don't believe it, but I but I never did. I never liked these 70s Marvel stories. The Mad Treasury is coming out soon. Oh, cool. The Mad reprint. I've wondered if I bought the idea that O'Neill was a good writer and maybe he never was. Yeah, I, I never I, I I can't think of anything by Denny O'Neill that I think is good writing. Iron Man. Iron Man? I don't even remember that. <clears throat> when when Luke McDonald was was drawing uh, and oh, okay. um and uh, Iron Man became a drunk again and uh, Obadiah Stein took over the company. I and we had about 6 months of issues where uh Rhodey took over the armor and uh Tony Stark was nothing but a wino. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was after I had stopped reading Iron Man regularly, but I read an issue or two of it. Yeah, it was slightly before Secret Wars, so yeah. Iron Man. Yeah, I never liked I never liked uh, Denny O'Neill's um Green Lantern, Green Arrow. I never liked his Batman, but I didn't like I any of the writing at DC Comics in the 70s. Hmm. So it's not uh not unusual that I didn't like that stuff. Like I can't that uh, didn't he write Daredevil in the eighties too, or something? Danny O'Neill, yeah. Uh, after Frank Miller, after well, Larry Yama did some stuff, uh, but it, it was Danny O'Neill with uh, William Johnson, okay. and then David, David Mazzucchelli started drawing while, while O'Neill was on board. It was that storyline with um, <laughs> with Foggy's wife uh, cheating on him with that uh, English nobleman who had been. The Senate of uh, explorers who were trapped in the jungle for uh, for two hundred years, <laughs> <laughs> and they 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 went to New York as a scientific curiosity, uh, mm. and then they decided they wanted to take over the king the kingpin's territory for no reason. <laughs> the original demon in the bottle was Michelini. Yeah, Leighton, right. Yeah, that was the second go round. But yeah, the 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 English guy's name was Micah Sin. <laughs> the storyline then, then kind of fizzled out on, on itself. <laughs> and I was showing off this mini comic I got mm -hmm. from um, one of the, uh, my, I, one of the old bullpenners, my friend Michael Kreger, has been teaching at the um, Joe Cooper School of Cartooning now for a few for a bunch of years, mm -hmm. and this is one of his students who coincidentally happens to watch my YouTube channel at least the pull list halls every week so he Jesse Marsh is his name no relation to the Tarzan artist <laughs> Craig was like that's the first thing I asked him so this is I always love to see these minis you know that's a digest size it's not a mini comic da -da -da. No, this is a mini comics. It, mini comics were eight and a half by eleven folded over. If it doesn't fit into a pack of smokes, it's not a mini comic. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, then it would that, be that's a that's, reg, that's regular size in several European countries. Oh, okay. In the nineties in the US, this would be a mini comic or a zine. If there was no comics in it, it would be a zine. 
Mm-hmm. There are comics in it, but you're right. They also have ones this a quarter of this size that were mini yeah. comics. But I was using, I always called them both mini comics. That's what that just. You never run run arc too long, and then an arc too long, it becomes boring. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, now that never happens because everything was written for trade. So five, six issues, then you move on. Yeah, the, you, 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 you know it's boring because uh, you read the first issue and nothing happened. <laughs> and here's here's a funny coincidence. As I was talking to Dean Haspiel, I was telling him about the book I started reading on the train ride in, which is this one I got a few months ago, Kirby at Marvel. Um, Not the official version. This is the creation of the Marvel Universe, according to Kirby. And I was standing there talking to him, going, yeah, I'm reading this book. And who was at the table next to him? But the Kirby Museum, hmm. who had this book sitting on their table. But this has been a very interesting read. Um, because it goes through all the evidence of the creation of the Marvel Universe. And who created what? The actual evidence for it. <laughs> Stan Lee didn't create a whole lot. <laughs> um which I always knew, but to see it in black and white is like, huh, interesting. And it goes month by month what comics came out and what Kirby did. And um, Kirby's story uh, was always that um, Martin Goodman was going to close down Marvel comic books, but he came in with what he called the Blitz. A whole bunch of ideas and um, pitches for a bunch of superhero comics because he thought superheroes were going to work. And uh, it it goes through the evidence for what comics were based on those Kirby pitches. Mm-hmm. So it's it's real interesting to read. <laughs> and the 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 Kirby Museum had that the documentation. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's all based on interviews given and analysis of what work Kirby was doing and other people were doing for Marvel at uh, week to week. Like, um, you know, one thing, line up uh, on sale September and October 1958. Like, mm-hmm. there's the lineup of things and... In September of 58, Kid Cult Outlaw, Billy the Model, Patsy Walker, Tales of Suspense, Two Gun Kids, mm-hmm. and then three Kirby books, Strange Worlds, Tales to Astonish, Worlds of Fantasy. And they were saying, you know, Martin Goodman had to have noticed that all the Kirby books were selling the best in the late 50s. <laughs> well, that's not exactly true. Patsy Walker was selling the best. And Strange Tales was the science fiction comic that was outselling the other ones. It, and that one was the one with the least Kirby material. Uh, let's see. Because the the the, sale, the sales numbers from the from the statements of, sta- the statements of ownership started carrying average sales numbers around 1962. I actually found um, I'll have to show it to you. Where and, were we? And, we were discussing... John Jackson Miller, John Jackson Miller's website is still up, even if it, even if they don't have new sales numbers. And, and uh, the sixty-two numbers have Patsy Walker and Strange Tales as the best sellers at Marvel at the time. Yeah, I, I can't pull the numbers out of that, but I want to show you. I found this chart. There we go. Actually, let me see if I can bring this over here. Why don't I do that? What I do believe is that is that stuff with Kirby covers. If you put a Kirby cover every month, the comic would 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 have sta- stable sales numbers. That I believe it was was possible. Okay, I airdropped it right. Sent. Let's see where is this. This is a chart of um, 
Marvel Sales. What the hell is this named? Uh, th this is unrelated to the book. Where did this just go? I love when I airdrop something and have zero idea where it airdropped to. <laughs> went to my comp, went to my uh, laptop, I assume, but where is it? Nope. Great. Th this is the problem when working with. Uh... Is that it? Is that it? I think I found it. Hold on. There we go. This is the problem when working with iPads and iPhones. You can't name things what you want to name them. Let me share this graphic with you. This is Marvel. This um, this I found was a guy who was making the same argument I was that Stan Stan Lee's um, college tour really didn't have much of an effect on sales. They were kind of already going up and kept going up. So he made this. Let me show you this chart. To present, share screen, where is it? There we go. Here's the chart. Let me get it bigger so you can actually see it. This is a chart uh, of the sales of... I don't have to send this to you separately. From 1960... Too. I think, it, oh, here's, he said the cartoon affected sales more than Kirby at DC. So, so he was just trying to make the argument. Um, he was trying to make the argument that um, Stan Lee's hucksterism really didn't affect as sales as much as legend has it. Hmm. Let me see. But, and let me see if I can, can't get this all in at once. Hold on, let me make this bigger. Let me hit tab on that. So this is 10th ranked comics. Yeah. I've, my brain can't make sense of this right. I guess that's when Stan left in 72. Yeah. And that didn't really affect it. Here's when the cartoon hit. Sales have been steadily going up. The thing yeah. is, okay, uh, right. So, strength. When I saw, I saw another chart that had. Um, where do I have that one? I don't know. Sa sales had been going up before '65 in his tour and kept going up. Yes. So I don't know what what effects. It's like there was no bump for Stan Lee's college tour stuff. Right. The thing is, I like to have the sales for Millie the Model and Patsy Walker because Patsy Walker took a took a dive right after the superheroes started. Let's see, do we have and, no? We but have it's it. but it's not there because it's not the no. superheroes. But you can but the numbers but the numbers are available because they're in the statements of <laughs> statements of right. ownership for 1962. So I don't know where they got the numbers for 60 and 61 because the, those those were not public. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to have to find where I found that because I don't remember right now. <laughs> well, I'll find it again and send you a link to it. Hmm. But yeah, the, the, this is full. They they actually tell you where they got all their information here. The Where is it? The... The, no the numbers I remember from Comicron... They put Strange Tales and Patsy Walker as the highest sellers in 1962. The end world. notes are actually bigger than the book. <laughs> These are the end notes <laughs> over here. So it's some pretty fun stuff. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. 
It gets, course, there, there, there was already a point in, 19, in 1960 where Stan wanted Kirby to do everything because that's when uh, the, 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 there was one war title still, uh, still going on and Kirby started drawing for it, but the sales didn't pick up for that one. And there's Kirby material in the last four or five issues for, for battle. And, but it got canceled anyway. There's no war material until the until Sergeant Fury starts. And, Kirby and... then did Kirby did romance. He took the the rom, the 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 the, the, rom, the art for the romance comics was being done by by Vince Coletta Studio because there's a lot of Vin Dick, which is how Coletta and, and Giordano would sign the the stories. And, uh, and I then... didn't realize too that Stan Lee would take. Jack Kirby's signature. It was actually Dick Ayers signing for Jack Kirby on mm -hmm. some of the early stuff. And often Stan Lee would white it out. I never realized that before. Uh, they could tell from the original art. <laughs> mm -hmm. And here's something I had never heard before. I was just reading this today. Testifying independently, John Severn and Steve Ditko placed Sergeant Fury's origin firmly in the Kirby's Blitz pile. That was the pile that he gave uh, Goodman when yeah. Goodman said he was closing down Marvel. Yes, Severin said that he and Kirby had been developing Sergeant Fury as a potential uh, newspaper strip. Severin recounted Kirby's newspaper strip pitch to him in the late 1950s near Columbus Circle of an adult boy commandos. And I never heard it described that. I'm like, there's the perfect description for an adult boy. Yeah, commandos. yeah. If you if you kind of kind of take a look at all the designs and uh, and and the, the slapstick comedy uh, when there when there there's no war action. Yeah, yeah. adult boy commandos is a good description. Yeah. Yeah, an adult boy commandos. <laughs> Ditko wrote that Lee told him Marvel was doing a war comic because Goodman wanted it. Goodman happened to have such a concept on hand, and Lee was not involved. So that was interesting. An adult boy commandos. If that doesn't describe the howling commandos perfectly, I don't know what does. But it's been fun reading that one. Hmm. <laughs> Funny that uh, they were right next to me as I was describing it to Dean. Hold on. I've got to blow my nose. Yeah, but the, the, the thing about Sergeant Fury, I remember reading about that. Uh, and it was the only war comic until 1970. A, a lot of that stuff... I'm sure that Kirby wanted to invent more stuff, but since they, they had the title limitation... Uh, they, there was really no point in creating that much, that much more. And I didn't realize too, they, they'd call Kirby in when they needed stuff created. Like mm -hmm. they were just talking about, um, there was a couple of books like, oh, the, the man in the ant hill, you know, Kirby created that. And then it was taken over by whoever, Heck or Sever. And then when the Wasp needed to be created, Kirby did that issue. Yep. So it was like every time there was a character to be created, Kirby was the one creating it. Yeah, Dick Ayers was the the the, the standard the standard artist on um, on Ant Man, and Bob Powell after it became Giant Man. Although if if Stan needed, he would mix and match. Yeah. Because Kirby created Thor, but Kirby did not draw the most of the first issues of Thor. They they, they mentioned uh, they mentioned that in here. Thor Journey into Mystery, the Kirby free streak on Thor and Journey into Mystery clearly demonstrated the sort of quality that Lee was capable of producing without him. Yep. It consisted of a single story drawn by Al Hartley, number 90, followed by five Joe Sinnott stories, 91, 92, 94, and 6, through 6. They were execrable. For, un for reasons unknown, Kirby showed up for a single story in the middle. 
In the credit box on all stories following Lee's honorary plot credit, Lieber gets script credit for the first two issues with Robert Bernstein as R. Burns on the rest, including Kirby's. According to Pattern, Lieber was removed as credit candidate before Kirby's return. Other than the Kirby story, the true identity of the plotter on each is anybody's guess. Because they, one of the things they point out here is that Stan Lee didn't plot anything. Kirby plotted all the Kirby books. Hartley wouldn't, wouldn't need it because he, he, at the time he was already writing stuff. Right. Uh, he was Senna... already plotting stuff. No writing. Yeah, Hartley writing, was yeah. a writer. Oh, Hartley oh, was who, a writer. Who am I thinking of? Who's the mini the model writer uh, the, artist? Uh, Stan Goldberg. Stan Goldberg was writing. He was plotting yeah. Mini the model. Uh, Millie the model. Mm -hmm. Right. Although it wasn't that hard. Uh, the all of the teen humor books, they would recycle jokes every year or so. <laughs> and you can t you can tell from from certain types of covers that existed way back in 1948-1949 and they kept being used throughout the 50s and, uh, until the 60s. <laughs> Danny DeVito was a mini comic as he can fit into a pack of smokes. How, how does that call back to our mini it's, comics? It's, it's smoke it from the inside. You don't see it. Yeah. I had I have essentials of Roy High Kid. It's mostly Kirby and Ayers with a few at the end by Jack Davis. The first half of the book title pages all have only Stan Lee's name. Yeah, Stan Lee used to uh, uh, white out. Kirby used to not sign it, but when he worked with Ayers, Ayers would sign it for him. That's what this, according to this. And then Stan Lee often would white it out. And th and there was big there was big controversy over who wrote the. Jack Kirby drawn monster books, which I never knew. Because um, in the 50s, Stan Lee signed everything he did. If he wrote it, he said, I mean, he signed things he didn't do. Mm -hmm. But there was no Stan Lee signature on the Kirby monster books. Yeah, it's and it it's impossible that it's Larry Lieber. Right. Uh, Who didn't take credit for them till the 90s. Right. <laughs> So Jack it's, Kirby was the one who wrote the. Well, we know he plotted them at least, you know, wrote and plotted. Yeah, yeah. Although I've seen people, you know, in the Facebook groups, there are people claiming that it was Kirby distributing work for the other artists, and I don't yeah. see that happening. I don't, I don't understand why. If he had an idea for a monster, why he wouldn't just draw it himself, and why right. would Don Hack draw it, or it, or or they or they were even claiming something even more convoluted that Kirby would tell about the monster, tell Stan Lee about the monster, and then Stan Lee would assign the story to Don Hack. Mm -hmm. Why? For starters, I don't believe that Stan Lee knew the what the monster was. <laughs> Well, Stan Lee was running scams the whole time. Mm -hmm. What he would do too, because you know he made his million dollars one plot at a time mm -hmm. uh, that he and wouldn't write. He would, that... he would. They would sometimes recycle those monster stories. Yeah, yeah. And, and we can. T there, there are notes on the Grand Comics database uh, that uh, many of those non-monster stories were recycled. Even if they were signed by Stan on the new for the new dialogue, the uh -huh. plot was recycled from something else that had been written in, in the in the mid to mid to late fifties by by a guy that wasn't there anymore. Right, and what he would do too. Sometimes he wouldn't even write the dialogue. He'd say, "Jack, I want you to repencil this story," mm -hmm. and then he'd take the Jack penciled story, assign it to a writer, and then Stan would take the plot credit and money. Mm -hmm. Even though he didn't plot anything on it, mm -hmm. I mean, he'd do that with Jack Kirby stories anyway. Like, um, because that's why you know that's why you know some guys wouldn't work for him. He'd Jack Kirby would do the initial writing and plot with dialogue all in the that they have the original art. There's dialogue written on them, and then Stan Lee would take those pages, give them to Larry Lieber, and say script this, and then it would say. You know, script Larry Lieber, plot Stan Lee, art Jack Kirby, and Stan Lee would get paid for a plot he never did. Hmm. There, there are stories which uh, some of the historians have identified as being leftover scripts from Carl Wessler, <laughs> and those many of those Wessler stories were recycled. 
Evening comic crack. Yeah. But Wessler, Wessler never ne- never signed, and the only reason why people know it's Wessler is because he he kept records of what he sold. Sometimes uh, the title the title will be changed, but you could tell from the title and, and plot synopsis uh, what where the story came out, and uh, they think they identified most of the Wessler stories. But there are Wessler scripts which have been recycled, and, and if you go through all of the Monster Comics uh, over in the Grand Comics database, you'll find on the notes recycled from so and so, which uh, at one time they were backtracking it uh, to a to credit uh, Leapless Lieber <laughs> because some of those were signed Leapless Lieber at the end of the of the monster run in 1963 or 64. Uh, but of course they were not they were obviously were not Leapless Lieber because they came from the other guys. Uh, and, and if there are other monsters we we don't actually know. It's quite possible that that uh, there are a few there are scripts from the men's magazine division. Right. Uh, because Bob Beerbohm, uh, he keeps insisting that one of his friends was a ghostwriter on a lot of stuff. Right. But even Marie Severin said, oh, that guy was talking shit all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it is possible that some, that some of those uh, some of those uh, guys from the men's magazine were writing, were writing the occasional script. It wouldn't be too different from writing a short story. Yeah. Uh, and I still think that Don Rico was around writing some writing some things. Uh. Now r- the you'll recall that Rico used to use the pseudonym Ann Korok on a few Iron Man stories uh-huh. because by that time he was already established uh, on the West Coast, uh, r- uh, writing scripts and uh, and novels, and he didn't want to find out. He didn't want people to find out that he was. Uh, being paid less to write comics, uh-huh. as comics. Pay. <laughs> uh-huh. So it, it, I don't think it's out of the ordinary if to that to think that there there are Don Rico uh, scripts in there, uh-huh. especially for the Don Hack stuff or for the 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 romance stuff. Uh-huh. This week's talk is Stan the Huckster. Yeah, yeah. We we usually go back a lot to a lot to Stan. Yeah, because he's you know. He's he's the central figure in Marvel Comics, so and it's amazing that he actually created so little, but is credited with so much. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's kind of crazy. A modern comic I got this week that was good. I finally picked up an issue number four of Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees. This one has been getting hot recently, and more than one person has said, have you read that one, Jared? Uh, on YouTube. It's got this sort of uh, kid style. Mm-hmm. But it's not a kid's comic. And what was good about this was Picked up issue four, understood everything. There was no problem. Um, The story is about, uh, I didn't even realize this bear was female to the end. This, This little bear lives in this quaint little town. And at the beginning, the town's all kind of desolate and quiet because you slowly pick up on the fact that there's some sort of murders have been happening in this town that's got everybody on edge. Uh, And then later on, we're introduced to this second character, who's this mouse. Um, There's a nice little scary throat throat slitting in these uh, cute animals. So we've got a lead character who's this uh, female bear, teddy bear. We've got this second character who's a mouse, a dude, I think he is. And it turns out that the female character is some kind of serial killer. (laughs) But she goes off, she goes away from, she does not do her killing where she lives. 
she goes out to but but this little mouse who it turns out is also a, some sort of nutso killer when he moves into town and kind of follows her and stumbles onto the fact that she's a serial killer so he really wants to team up with her he's like we can team up and be do all the serial killing we want and she's like you killed these guys in town you never do that get out of here so she wants nothing to do with him so then what does he do she she works at like a hardware store she owns in town he frames her for killing someone, her worker at the hardware store, and thus frames her for the other killings that have been going on in town. So at the end, she has to take off from town. So now we've got this. So it was a really good... I, I think this issue probably revealed a lot of what was going on in the first three issues because I understood it perfectly. So we've got two serial killers living in this town, one who just framed the other for murder. But it was really well done, well written, well drawn. I liked it a lot. This was going on my poll list. <laughs> Jared, your lenses need cleaning. Probably. <laughs> Since Stan Lee died, I've heard numerous stories of him not being the nicest person. He was, an, he was a nice person. He just stole. <laughs> no, if you did something that displeased him, you would be very vindictive. Yeah. I mean, you you can be a nice person and have done bad things. Mm -hmm. Maybe not be a serial killer, but you know. <laughs> Beneath the trees where nobody sees two and three are getting reprints on April 3rd. I'll have to look out for them. See if I can still pre-order them. Would anyone younger than 30 know the lyrics to that teddy bear picnic? Interesting choice for a title. <laughs> I don't know where it comes from, Beneath the Trees Where Nobody Sees. That's from a song? I guess so. I know Sam the Bear got pissed at the other killer. Don't hit where you sleep. Yeah. The mouse kills her boss. Was it her boss or her? I couldn't tell if it was her boss or the person she worked with under her. So you missed the, yeah, that's what it is. I missed the buildup. Ah, yeah. But it was good. I understood this issue perfectly. I, I figured after reading this, I missed the buildup, but oh well, you know. I I'm fine with starting with it. Issue four was a good place to start. If, you know, since you got to start somewhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm not one of those people who's going to not buy a comic because uh, I missed the first three issues. You've had Mocha this week. We have Comic Con Portugal. Ah. But they moved back to the north of the country so that I could uh, purposely so that I couldn't go. <laughs> it's a th it's a three and a half hour drive. Ah. But not only that, it's a it's a two hundred dollar trip. Tolls, gas, food, and ticket. That's a big commitment. Yeah, and that's before buying anything. Of course, there's no point in, in spending money because the, there's nobody selling comics there. Uh. It's Comic Con in name only, but there are comic uh, comic book people there. Let me see the uh, comic guests. Who do we right, have? We they have the comics people mis mixed in with the literature people. So who do we have? Okay. Hello, hello. <laughs> okay, so yeah, of course, the our international superstars Jorge Coelho and Andrea Lima Rouge were there. So so is Daniel Enriquez, the guy who did the who did the inking on a uh, on the new Ronin. Uh, who are these people? Ah, of course the the best. The best Spanish cartoonist of all time, Miguel Ancho Prado. The Miguel Ancho Prado is what if is Kafka if he was Latin? Huh. <laughs> uh, Juan Diaz Canales, uh, author of author of Black Sad, is there? 
And of course, this one has me stumped why they would ask him. Uh, I think it's a great that it's here, uh, but it's never been published in Portugal. Uh, people who buy foreign uh, comics in English do know who he is, of course. Stan Sakai is the, oh. the biggest biggest name here. <laughs> he, and, he and his wife came. Uh, Ryan Otley, Frank Cho, Mike Grell. So finally, Mike Grell supposedly finally comes, and I'm not there because <laughs> I did I did the I did the 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 virtual panel with him. Right. Back when, when there was COVID. <laughs> Frank Cho. Huh. Yeah, Frank Cho, and of course we have Francois Bouc. And Ryan Otley has been. He's is he still working for Marvel? I think Ooh. so. Let me see. Is, he was doing like Spider Man last I knew. Once Invincible yeah. left. Yeah, uh, Hulk two, I get. I think the and oh and the uh, Jordi Lefebvre. Is, what has he been in working on? Jordi Lefebvre. Well, Do you think Ryan Otley made more or less money on Invincible or Spider Man? Oh. When he moved to Spider Man, did he take a pay cut or get a raise? I, I guess wonder. it depends. I guess it depends on how much he gets from page rate and how much he gets yeah. from from royalties. I wonder. That'd be an interesting question to know the answer to. Well, we'll have to email him and see. <laughs> see if he'll answer that. Because who knows what royalties yeah. are for Spider-Man these days? Yeah, the thing is, nobody records that thing. Nobody films that thing, and it's a shame because uh, it would be a good uh, idea. And even when I did panels, I didn't record them. I should have. Uh, <laughs> huh. Take that two hundred dollars and spend it at Fantagraphics this weekend with their fifty dollar get fifty dollar best deal of the year. Mm -hmm. There you go. What about the Fantagraphics sale? I have not. Good time to get the complete Red Rooms trade. That's right. Book. OQ, did you say? Hopefully I spelled that right. Yeah, it is. Book. Francois Book. Book. Yep. I was looking at the complete hate series by Bag. So was I, but I, I have the... Um, I got the sort of pocketbook editions for fairly cheap, so I haven't gotten that hardcover one yet. Someday I might. And there's a new hate five issue series coming out this starting this summer, I think, by Peter Bag. Yeah, the, 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 the image K guys. Ryan Otley. I haven't yeah. seen anything by Ryan Otley from Image. Ryan Otley is on the Energon Universe Special 2024. Is oh, that's the um, Transformers, uh, GI Joe, um, Skybound Universe, yeah. right? Energon. Mm -hmm. Going to get the new mini series? I am. I'm, the new hate series, I will definitely put on my poll list. No the, doubt. The K Fape guys interview, interviewed Bag over it. Yeah. Did you watch it at all? Yeah. How was it? Uh, well, it's like he wants to revisit uh, re revisit the things. Appa apparently, the, the characters are still very much the same cause <laughs> <laughs> as, uh, as when the from the last time they appeared, but they will be older. Yeah, Buddy it, buys a dump. That was the last one. Because Bag is older, so the so Buddy has to be older. But that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think all the hate all together as one thing is the great American novel of the late twentieth century. It just really does a good job of showing sort of a portrait of a man's life. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Another uh, thing I got this week is the magazine-sized. If you find this, I'm already dead. Ooh, ominous. Let me show you some art. Art by Dan McDade and Bill Crabtree, written by Matt Kint. There's the back cover. I don't know why she's got these scrawl marks on her chin. She must have put them on there. But some nice artwork. Mm -hmm. 
this is this is sort of another style of artwork you see these days sort of this wavy lined indie artwork yeah I, I i just came up with that name for him as i was <laughs> looking at this because there's like not a straight line in the place no it it, it makes the the art three-dimensional without it becoming needing to turn it photorealistic yeah yeah and there's lots of spotted blacks in some ways it's like they're trying to approach will eisner yeah but it's, but it's not eisner no no it's you know what it is and i fall in this category too i would say it's people who like there's lots of folds in here like this whole thing is all folds but it's not folds based on realism it's full they're sort of graphic design folds it's based on it's based on other drawings of folds like if you look at um Al Williamson and all those guys who could draw suits in the 50s and 60s. That stuff was all photo referenced. Noel Sickles, my God, his folds are beautiful. But they're all both they're all based on photographic observation. Right. These folds are not based on photographic observation. These folds are based on looking at al williamson's folds right and making it even more graphic designy kind of so and like that that's kind of the category i fall into too and that's what i think this wavy line style is it's it's cartooning based on cartooning not right. observation it's right. cartooning based but on the observation of cartooning yeah but the 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 faces the, they they're three-dimensional using yeah scratchy lines not not wavy right right there's, there's different techniques in it definitely it's mm -hmm. not just it's not all wavy line but the wavy line but like it's it's cartooning based on cartooning kind of thing and you never they never they're they're not aiming for the realism of photography or the realism of real life. They've got they're they're, they're aiming for the realism of graphic design. Is all I can like like you said. We, uh, um, Will Eisner might be the the grandfather of this style. <laughs> so we got a lot of comments. I saw that. Wasn't the best interview of him I've seen. Uh, Comic Crack says about the Peter Bag interview. Peter Bag did mini circus punk art toys on Dead Queen tells us. I did not know that. <laughs> Comic Crack says he's doing a mix of catching up with their family as they would be now older, and then them short stories will be flashbacks. Think Stinky is going to be in some. Oh, cool. That was one of the weirdest twists of uh hate when stinky died that was weird <laughs> they're not cheap to get now oh the toys yeah i, I didn't know they were they were out i comic crack says i remember when those circus punks were coming out i bought one not the bag one unfortunately uh a mobius influence yeah it could be a mobius influence too that wavy line style that he he really, Mobius was very surrealism influenced, so he stepped yeah. away from that photographic reality. Those graphic design folder, uh, I always think of Paul, yeah, Paul Pope, definitely. He would fall into uh, a graphic design cartoon. But right, Mobi Mobius tries to do more, his style is more so that it can fit an ambiance. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think that's what you were seeing there. No, it's but so much some of the technical style. Mm -hmm. the technical style of Mobius um, 
like that he was going for a feeling so he wasn't sort of that classic photo referenced look mm-hmm. of you know, like Al Williamson and all those guys Jack Davis those sort of more interested in class those guys who were closer to the classic illustration period of the first half of the 20th century mm-hmm. good call tit Goblin. i was thinking warren dale johnson is a version of that yeah there's a lot of guys who are a version of that to anyone who does fit that stuff they're, they're like i said their their cartooning is about cartooning because i i think it really is because the A lot of those guys, like Al Williamson and his generation, were influenced by the illustrators who were rock stars in the early part of the 20th century. Lion Decker, uh, that's the only name I can remember now. Uh, But all those guys, in the beginning part of the 20th century, illustrators were the image makers of our culture. There was no no TV. Uh, Movies were just getting started. Uh, the people who made the images that everybody saw in mass media, magazines, newspapers, were illustrators. So those guys, and comic strip artists. So those guys were rock stars. And I think that second wave, like Al Williamson, were all influenced by those guys. And all those all those illustrators worked from life. They used observation, worked from photos. But as we got further and further away from them, guys like Daniel Warren Johnston or Dan McDade, we we started working from cartooning. Because those were the guys we saw. We These rock star illustrators were gone. That technique is gone. The loose hand style is more indie comics, definitely. I would say it's definitely more indie comics, though you will find some of it. More, but a lot of like Marvel and DC comics is 3D, you know, 3D programs influenced. They're the more realistic, if you want. But their realism is the realism of a 3D program. That's their reference, as opposed to the realism of observation or photographs. I think that. The Mobius was a master of the thin line, and it would vary as needed, like Toth creating clean shapes. Yeah. Well, Mobius in the in the eighties and and nineties before is that is not the same as when he was as Jean Giraud in the sixties. Right. Giraud, when he started doing Blueberry, uh, he was still very very much following the the same design patterns uh, as his. As his bot, as his former boss Gigi, uh, because uh, Giro started be as an assistant for G, for for Gigi, uh, who had uh, his own Western Western comic, which was very successful in the fifties and sixties, uh, and then then uh, Giro teamed up with, Char- with Charlier, who was the the originator of, of the blueberry of the blueberry comic, uh, but he, he so. That kind of predates the spaghetti western thing. So they they were more trying to do the uh, psychological western, which was was which was the the U.S. standard in the sixties. Yeah. Uh, but G- when Giro became Mobius, the it, 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 it started cha- changing the the way he drew lines. That was mostly for the science fiction material. That that's the stuff he specifically said in that Art of Mobius book I have was mm-hmm. surrealism influenced. That's what yeah. that's what he was going for. Yeah, which is kind of probably kind of, kind of how he started to work got to got to work with Jodorowsky for for uh, yeah. for the Incal. but but then that became the also the the main theme for for a for the Arzak universe. But by that time, he he was doing well. I won't say jagged lines, but it. His three-dimensional stuff was not was no longer influenced by by Lin Of course, of course, he, he he was more of the he wasn't really Lin Claire. He was more he was more of the Spirou school, uh, which was had more real, more energetic and more realistic. And 
and since it was also uh, one of the first ones to move to move to Pilot when when that magazine was created, they followed more more along the lines of Spirou than than Illusion than Tintin. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you see the the guy who did the that uh, fake uh, fake uh, Phantom Indiana Jones cover? Yeah, I, I went and checked his Instagram, and he, he, he's very good at doing Link Claire. Uh, okay. he, he did a lot of uh, uh, a lot of images, Tintin doing crossovers, uh, John McClane, The Shadow, Rocketeer. Yeah, yeah and they're, they're they're really cute. They're really cute. It, 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 it is, if, if the the idiot that that uh, that's running uh, that's running the Tintin Empire for a uh, after he married uh, Erge's widow, he, if that idiot st uh, yeah. finally acknowledges that people want more Tintin stories, they should hire the, that that guy, even though he's American, to do that art. Yeah. Yeah, 70s. I'm not too familiar with the 70s underground era. I don't know a lot of underground. It was all gone by the time... Yeah, that, that's when they started doing the all, all of the stuff with elves, everybody, because of Wally, you know, because of Wally Woods. What was the Wally Woods elf elf thing called? I always forget. Yeah, the guys now use thicker lines and show speckles of motion, and line weight doesn't vary as much. Yeah, that um, that's in the like I said the the sort of no line weight. 3D rendered style is very popular in Marvel and DC stuff. Though I haven't, I haven't looked at a lot of their stuff in a while. That's what I noticed because, because uh, I think that was like a realism thing. Like when, um, what's his name, uh, Alex Ross came onto the scene in the '90s. He was sort of the first of the realism guys. And everybody wanted to paint like Alex Ross then. He was really influenced by those. He was like a throwback to being influenced by the early 20th century illustrators. Matter of fact, I heard someone someone once, I wish I wrote it down, explain to me the technique he was using, which was a 1950s technique. Um, but I think from then on in, due to Alex Ross and digital being born in the mid to late 90s. I think that's what got us to our 3D model era of, uh, and now with AI, we're going to see even more of it. Uh, just because AI can do, AI can do 3D model realism techniques really well. So you're going to see someday writers are just going to tell the machine what to do. And we'll have lots of mediocre AI comics. <laughs> well, right now the, the AI can do storytelling, so there's no point in it. Yeah. But the AI got a the got a lot better rec recognizing instructions in the in the last six months. So <laughs> it's gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> Sixty two lefty blues, I think. Uh, Think about it. Mobius was a master of the thin line. Right? Oh, that's we we read that one already. Seventies underground era, speckles of motion. Even an image, they get more thin line these days. They do. Yeah, they they let the colorist do the most yeah. the job of making things. Uh, that's because, yeah, the colorist now does the job the inker used to do, mm -hmm. which is clarity and storytelling and clarity in the image, but it doesn't always work the same. When books need more colorists to make the story pop, yeah. A, a colorist can really bury a story these days. Yeah, because a lot of a lot of the colorists seem to like pastels and neons, and, and they they look out of place in most places, in most in yeah. most art. Here's the first issue I got: little black book. Which was okay. Here's some thin line dart for you. Uh, let's see. Some 
some okay. This was just okay. The here's my favorite part. This nice uh house rendering in the beginning. <laughs> but it was a story of uh it's just, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I they, just didn't buy into the story. Mm -hmm. The Europeans, the, the Europeans skipped that the that completely with the color with the coloring, because yeah. not, they they all went to to painted art. <laughs> There's nothing bad about this. It just didn't grab me, and I thought the story was kind of dumb. In terms of. Um, uh how did this go okay there's this g g couple a guy and a girl who are young the woman's pregnant he's they're, they're just living in some house in texas and some guy comes up and says your estranged father left you this house they went to the new house in the new house they found this little black book and phone hence the title little black book and they were like what is this and they open it up and it's all these cleaners <laughs> and they're like uh i don't think that really means cleaners <laughs> right. i think that and then he begins to suspect his father was involved in something shady so then his wife is out one night and accidentally kill someone with her car on a dark road so what does the husband do he calls one of the cleaners instead of calling the cops and say i accidentally hit someone on the road calls the cleaners some random guy comes showing up dressed like he doesn't even know who he is puts throws the body in the trunk drives away says we'll take care of this And then at the Wolf end, he sees fiction. a missing poster for the woman and goes, oh, no, that's the woman that's in the trunk. And it's just like, <laughs> who would do that? I, I was just like, who, they, and, and even a pretty boring Franco Francovia cover, just a guy reading a book with another guy behind him. Like, and this one didn't grab me. It was okay, but the whole time, I'm like, you know what? If, if your wife accidentally hits someone with a car, you call the amb you call the ambulance. Mm -hmm. You don't call some random number you found in a book hidden inside the ceiling of a house. Yeah, only if you work for Marcellus Wallace, and yeah. then you call Mister Wolf. I'm gonna call this random but, number. Yeah, but that guy doesn't work for Marcellus Wallace, so he has. And the no cleaner's business. like, "Don't worry <laughs> about it. We'll charge it to the usual account." <laughs> All right. Who who in the I just couldn't buy into that guy calling any book in that cleaners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thumbs up, kitties. Yep, the pinks and the purples are getting ungodly bright. <laughs> Al Hirschfeld is the king of the thin line and lots of them. When it comes to the colorists, the ungodly bright colors. What a shot. That is some know. movie exactly. It's one hundred percent movie <laughs> logic, story logic. It's like you don't have a story unless he has a reason to call that the number in that book, which he doesn't. He's got no reason to call a number in that book. <laughs> but like without it, there's no story. So it's like, I'm like okay, I don't need this one. <laughs> It'll go in the done in one box. I didn't know El Urschfeld, but I just checked. Interesting style. Oh, yeah. He's a very famous uh, caricature cartoonist illustrator. Where, where does his work appear? Uh, magazines, mostly. Mm -hmm. Newspapers, magazines. All right. He so, would if get, you're, um, so if you're a comics fan, you're out of luck finding out who he is. Yeah. <laughs> unless, unless you read magazines and then you see right. his work. He would... He would do caricatures of the stars. He would be invited to Broadway show openings and do nice. illustrations of the Broadway show. He was real world famous, mm. not comic book famous. Comic book people probably didn't know who he was. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, the, but, he, the, but he is if, PBS if he was a cartoonist, part. if he was a cartoonist in the forties, uh, comic book people from the fifties and sixties would know. But right. nowadays, yeah, <laughs> he like he's had a, he's had at least one PBS special about him. Hmm. I remember seeing his his crusty inkwell. <laughs> was he the one who worked in a dentist chair? Dentist chair. How do you how do you draw in the dentist chair? I don't remember. I think it was a or was it a barber's chair? I think it was a dentist. He had some old dentist chair from like the early part of the century or something that he sat in and he worked. To draw like this? No, no, no. It just it just raised up. I think is all it did and okay. down. It wasn't that different from a drafting chair, but it looked funny. Mm -hmm. Another comic I got. I was hanging out at Dean Cosbeel's uh, Dean Cosbeel's Dean Hasbeel's table talking to him and a guy came over. I uh, was talking to a friend of Dean's was talking to him. Turned out to be Peter Ratovsky mm -hmm. who did this Damnation Diaries for Uncivilized Books. So I went and uh, oh, there's a there's a drawing Mm -hmm. that he gave me for buying the book. We'll show you a little of the art. And it's the story of a psychotherapist in hell. <laughs> Hell's only psychotherapist. I haven't read I it yet, of that. course. I doubt that. That is the only psychotherapist in hell. <laughs> But it looks pretty cool. It does. Interesting style. Yeah. There's the back cover. Looking a little... Uh, what is that? Engraving-ish. Gave me a little remark there. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact... Uh, she gave me a little remark too. Ozzy. 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 We <laughs> swallow that G. You swallow you know? the G, yeah. I was like, what was um one of my students' name that I always have to remember? Um Mahia. It's magic in Spanish. Mahia. What was that? Mahia. Mahia. I think she says a little. Not so. I don't. I don't remember. I'm always, I'm always trying to remember it as I say her name. Mahia. But I, I knew you'd know how to say it. There's a great documentary about Hirschfeld called The Line King. Free on Tubi, says 62 Lefty Blues. Yeah. Like I know he's he's probably got multiple documentaries on him. Like he was around for a long, long time. Uh, doing all sorts of famous people caricatures. Ah. Yeah. In hell, everyone. Everyone can hear you scream, but only one person listens. Damnation Diaries. I didn't notice that before. But he was Peter Rotovsky was a nice guy. And since he was a friend of Dean's, I was like, I'll buy that. I didn't get to meet um, the people who do uh, Sickness and Black Stars Above. Jenny Ha and Jenny Cha. And the guy who I think is her boyfriend or husband who, who writes with her. They were at the Uncivilized Books table, but not when I was over there. So sorry I missed out on meeting them. I would have liked to tell them that I enjoy their work. It's always good to tell people you enjoy their work. I always say, because a lot of people say, oh, I, I don't know what I'd say. I'm like, just say you enjoy their work. That's all you need to say. <laughs> You don't need to say anything deeper than that. Or you can if it comes up. 
Comic Rack says, anyone to get Batman Year One Artist Edition will be my third one. I don't think I can pass it up. Uh, Lonnie Nadler is the writer partner of Cha. Okay, Lonnie Nadler. There we go. That I missed him and her. <laughs> but I'm ordering. I'm ordering uh, Batman Year One for my friend. He asked me to order one at the comic shop for him. But uh, I don't think I'm getting one myself just because I'm not that big a Batman Year One fan. I mean, it's good. I've just read it enough time. I've, I, I have enough versions of it. I And I already have Mazza Kelly's uh, Daredevil. So... I mean, I wouldn't turn it down if somebody offered it to me, but I don't necessarily want to buy it myself. And I'll borrow Ed's. <laughs> so, is that something you'd buy, Paolo? Maybe. I mean, That's about my answer, the, 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 uh, the idea, if you just told me, would not appeal to me. Yeah. But that art, that art is pretty interesting. Yeah. And I think I noticed some of the characters doing things that you would not expect from being in hell. <laughs> <laughs> so I, just don't, I just don't care about the story is the only reason I'm not that interested in Batman Year One. Yeah. No, I, no, I, I don't need the darnest edition of something that I already have in a in regular. If I if I would buy if I would buy the artist edition, it's because I didn't have the story yet. Right. Yeah, but I would be willing to check out the art in black and white. Yeah, I buy the artist editions just so I can look at the artwork. So, mm -hmm. which reminds me, I haven't made a video of my Michael Golden one yet. That's the last one. I, I didn't realize I hadn't because I, I bought. I think I when I bought the Michael Golden one. I don't know a couple months ago. Um, that was the first artist edition I had bought since 2017. I think a lot of that has to do with you know I had no money and the room that they take up is a lot. <laughs> so it's tough. I have. I have. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen artist editions already. So it's, it's tough to find the room for them. <laughs> Not easy. I gotta build some more shelves. See this hallway back here? That's yep. just an empty pass through hallway. I want to put some shelves up on top of it. Just because there's room for them. Why not? <laughs> Pretty sure that's what they call an artist edition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they take up a lot of space, no doubt. Like, I, if I didn't have 14 of the 13, I also have the two portfolio ones. Walt Simonson's Lawnmower Man and Michael Golden's G.I. Joe. You know, that's just a lot of... Oh, and I also have the... Um, is it over? I don't even think it's over there. The uh... oh, there it's over there. The um, what's his name? Chris Ware one, which isn't quite an artist edition. It's just a big oversized edition of his art. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what else did I get? Born two fifty one. A new ruler, a new artist, a new direction. So our new artist on this is Brett Booth. Taken over from Carlos Barberi. I don't think I've ever had a Brett Booth comic on my pull list before. Even though he's been around forever. Spawn 251. We're taking the left at Albuquerque. <laughs> and I have to say, the Brett Booth art was pretty good. It usually but, is. But last issue's 
art, which was by Brett Booth and Carlos Barberi, was better than the just Brett Booth artwork. It was better than the Carlos Barberi artwork. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. So 350 was really nicely done that the two of them yeah. did. You, you, you know what Brett Booth was at, at Wellstorm? Tony Bennett. Because <laughs> Jim Lee is Sinatra. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't even, I'm not even sure if he was Tony Bennett. He might have been one notch below Tony Bennett. Mm. And here, in this, um, this end page would really be a lot more impactful if I had any idea who that was. Now, the thing about Brett Booth is is, uh, is technically more proficient and more storytelling driven, storytelling uh, storytelling driven than, than Jim Lee was. Yeah, and, and that's why people say he's not as good because because he's, he's trying to do storytelling with Jim Lee with Jim Lee style, and, he, and because of that, he, he doesn't have the time to be spectacular. Yeah, which. <laughs> So Tony Bennett to, to Frank Sinatra, <laughs> but it's real. It was, it was fine because Tony Bennett was a better singer than Frank Sinatra, but he didn't uh, have the the magnetic personality. It it, it was I, I enjoyed it, and the new direction is if you want to pick up Spawn, since the hell world, since the hell war is over. One of the consequences of the hell war was that all of the agents of heaven and hell on earth have been depowered so that all the angels and demons no longer have their power and this guy the king of their vampires blood has said okay this is my opportunity i'm gonna hunt down and kill all of the agents of heaven and hell and rule this place because he's got his vampire powers <laughs> so that's what's that's what's going to be going on in spawn now spawn's cape is all in tatters but uh he's he's proven he's still a badass that was until some guy with superpowers showed up whoever this guy is uh, i have no idea some vampire And then whoever this I, woman is showed up. It remember, was like, oh, there wait. was a, a, a mini series called Spawn the Impaler, which was the idea that uh, Dracula was a spawn. Ah. But I've never read it, so I don't know if, if it has anything to do with it. Still only $2.99. Oh, yeah. That's why it's on my pull list. Mm -hmm. But was it, you know, Spawn's is a solid comic book. May not be the comic book that gives you the most to talk about every month, but it's solid. Rory McConville is a solid writer. He was really good on oh, was that one time before time? That was good stuff. And Brett Booth is a solid artist, and you can always depend yeah. on him. What's it? Uh, Carlos Barberi was a solid artist too. Definitely. I'd like to. I'd like to see if, if you can. Can you tell when there's additional dialogue by Todd McFarlane? Yes. I can definitely tell when the usually you can definitely tell when it goes to one of those description pages where the, with the TV talking to you. But I can tell when suddenly something is being described that doesn't need to be described. I'm always like, oh, that's Todd McFarlane. You'd think that an artist would know that he doesn't need to, to describe so. things. Yeah. You'd think <laughs> that after writing hundreds of comics, Todd McFarlane would have improved his writing, but it has not. I mean... He, he doesn't need to. He thinks his writing is very advantageous. <laughs> That's what amazes me the most, it, it, that his writing has not improved one iota since he started writing. It just, I'm like, how? How could, how is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be particularly 
huh, what's the word I'm looking for? You have to have no sense of your own reality. I guess it doesn't, to... isn't it? That's the thing about being taught, isn't it? Yeah. He doesn't have he doesn't need to have a sense of reality. No yeah. sense of self awareness. <laughs> I mean uh, strange. Strange. I, I wonder if Todd thinks he doesn't need to do or, or he, that he doesn't need to actually do anything for the rest of his life. Is it and he probably doesn't. He probably doesn't I, need to do anything for the rest of his life. I think he likes doing things, so he does yeah. things. Like additional dialogue. Like, he likes writing, so he writes. He's just not a good writer and has never improved. Mm -hmm. That's what's so bizarre. You would think doing something for 30 years, you'd, approve, you'd automatically improve at it. But he hates it. I guess Greg Capullo never told him, Todd, I love you, but you don't need to write this. Okay. <laughs> He's the I'm boss. Like you can tell the boss that. That'd be I wrong. Know. Well, that depends on what the bo on what the boss thinks he is. Yeah, and who the boss is. A good boss would like to improve, but yeah, but he's Todd. Uh, he doesn't need to. <laughs> His My webbing. comics sold one and a half million copies in 1992. His webbing, advantageous. Yeah, and he's writing too. <laughs> we made fun of that all day when that issue came out. Mm -hmm. Advantageous, webbing, advantageous. Yes, it's what, doesn't know what a word means. <laughs> <laughs> Do, have, have you ever read that that uh, Grant Morrison comic, Doom Force Special? What's the name of it? Doom Force Special. Doom Force Special, no. It's a parody comic that Morrison did at DC, and the art style uh, is made to resemble Rob Liefeld. <laughs> and the, char the characters are, are, all look like image characters, uh, and Grant inserts the word advantageous everywhere for no particular reason. <laughs> Those guys made so much money, though, they were immune to being made fun of. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, they would have wars amongst themselves. <laughs> I'm the reason Image is a success. No, I'm the, re the reason Image is a success. <laughs> I don't care. I sold everything to DC. <laughs> he sold everything to DC because he couldn't sell it to Marvel. <laughs> and he still works at DC to this day. Yeah. Rob Rob once said in a in his podcast that uh, one of the one of the, the the real reason he got ousted from the from the Heroes Reborn deal is because they were fighting to see who was going to become the editor in chief at Marvel because they were going to fire everybody and they would uh, and either one one of them would would become the the edit, the new editor in chief and. And Jim Jim was also Jim Lee was also looking for somebody to buy the company, and Marvel was the prime candidate. Uh, but Marvel was going through bankruptcy, so they couldn't buy stuff. Right. So he sold it to DC. Yeah, but you guys knew that that, that you were being replaced, right? Oh, there was there was every rumor in the place. They were going to farm everything out. They were going to, but the. But the people who could make those deals were being replaced faster than the deals could be made. Yeah, I remember there were like three. I remember see, seeing in the indicia there were like three presidents in a in a year and a half. Yeah, and 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 that's why the Heroes Reborn stuff didn't get renewed either. Because the guy who made the Heroes Reborn deal with Lee and Liefeld was gone by the time it appeared. So the next guy wanted nothing to do with the last guy's deal. <laughs> we just trudged on getting the comics out the door. Yeah. This weird limbo state. Can you imagine if you, if, if you had put out issue number one of The Authority? <laughs> yeah, because... Uh, 
Warren Ellis did get his, I think Marie Javins hired him early on. Yeah. Mar Marie was at X-Men at the X-Men office in 1980. No, she was, she was in the Epic office. And then after Epic kind of folded, she was kind of that she got all the special projects and all the weird books. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, Warren Ellis was writing Hell Hellstorm for her. That would be 1995. That's where I first read his stuff. 94, 95, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And and, th and it's only after that that he goes to to Excalibur. Yeah, I don't know where he went after that. He, he did Excalibur in twenty in Doom twenty ninety nine around the same time. I I remember reading some of his reading some of his Hellstorm stuff, and it, you know, and it caught my eye. I was like, oh, this guy's pretty good. So then, when I saw he was going over to Stormwatch, I picked up that. So Stormwatch may have been the first. Uh, Warren Ellis written book that was on my pull list. Yeah, that was still in 95, I think. And I've, you know, been buying his stuff ever since. I'm on his uh, Sunday email list now. Hmm. I don't know what he's doing nowadays. I think he wanted stuff. I think he still wants uh, his stuff to go on TV, but. Uh... Oh, he, he does a lot of stuff. I mean, he, every Sunday I get an email from him telling you what he's doing. And uh, he's done a, What did he do? He wrote two seasons of Castlevania. Really? A cartoon show for based on the video game. Oh, he's, he's busy as can be, but he hasn't done comic. He's got a couple of comic book projects in the works, but uh, he can't talk about them yet. He's always got code names for his projects until he can yeah. announce them. <laughs> yeah, how was buying his new Universal, uh, which was the, the that new Universe reboot he was doing? But right. then he lost he lost all his files because he didn't know what a what backing up was. Yeah, he's a bit of a not computer literate kind of guy, right? Which is kind of funny because I, I remember. Uh, about 20 years ago, he, w he was, uh, even before he, did, he had the Warren Ellis Forum, uh, he was active on, on, on Usenet. And he said something about doing his first novel. And I couldn't have done this novel without the internet, because I would have to go on a library to read books about this and that. It, it would have taken forever. So now I have the internet, and, and I can look stuff up, and I can write a novel. <laughs> yeah all your research is made easier what is it Castlevania on Netflix four seasons Warren Ellis written and you did a good job with it says 62 Lefty Blues okay mm -hmm. I did not know that even though I have Netflix <laughs> but I don't usually watch cartoons so there might be a but like I said, I read. I I usually read his email uh, newsletter every week, so I generally know what he's up to. Let's see what else did I get this week? Showed that one. only six comics. Oh, he, um, Pop's Chocolate Shop of Horrors. Another one of these Archie books. Not a very good cover. There's only two cover choices on this one, and neither was particularly good. Uh, eye boil milkshake with finger fries. I mean, it's okay. But the, know, the inside was pretty good. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I really don't know what, what those insistences with doing Archie horror. It, it, they, they only remind me of the Halloween the Halloween episodes on the Simpsons. Uh, so it's the reason is to give me something to buy. <laughs> <laughs> it actually is. These Archie horror books are actually pretty good. I enjoy them and they're real horror. They're not, you know, 
a horror in the Archie Comics universe horror. Like in, in this particular issue, there's there's usually three stories. They're usually tied together with some framing sequence. And this framing sequence is, I guess this is Pops. Uh, the devil trying to make a deal with him to get uh, Pops to be his cook in hell. <laughs> and then we get the story of um, Jughead accidentally takes home this little shop of horrors man-eating plant. And the man-eating plant takes Archie and puts him in this kind of suspended animation and has Jughead bring him people to eat. So, Jughead, I started out killing evil people, so it didn't feel as icky. I was kind of like a superhero, but like one of the dark, tormented ones who inhabit a moral gray area. But evil folks <laughs> proved tough to find, secret hideouts and all that. So I just moved on to people who are kind of annoying. <laughs> people so who play mobile Reggie. games in public with the volume on. Uh, Anime fans who yell at you for watching dubs. Gym bros who talk about their juice cleanses, etc. So this, you know, Jughead's really killing people in this. <laughs> so it's really, and then Pops comes and saves them eventually. So it's the right, it's the writer's pet peeves. Yeah, that is exercising through uh, through Jughead. Yep. Then we get another story with Pops and dead. Like there's death and dismemberment and blood and real horror in these. It's not you know fake Archie comics horror. So that's why I enjoy them. So the another like I usually they have really good covers too. This is the first one. That has a real clunker of a cover for me. Uh, who did this cover? That is not a terrible cover. It's main cover, Adam Gorham. Variant cover, Aaron Lee. Which one is this? Does it say? This is cover A. So this is... And like, it's, it's well rendered and everything. I, it just doesn't grab me. But I got to say, the, I've, I've got... A, I've got a, at least a dozen of these Archie horror books now. I buy them regularly as they come out. So, like I said, this, yeah, I find them fun. <laughs> so that's why Archie's putting them out. Like if if they were sort of like um, bland horror Archie, you know, like because uh, because those are clearly aimed at adults, not kids. If it was horror Archie, sort of aimed at. Kids, I wouldn't be interested in it. But there's real murder, and, and the Archie characters are evil in them. <laughs> so it's fun. Well, they already were evil. Yeah. That's the secret about the Archie universe. Yeah. <laughs> They're all evil. But I think um, I think there's a trade paperback collection of them now. Hmm. For those interested in some Archie horror and trade paperback. <laughs> TPB. Mm -hmm. well, I didn't buy anything this week. I already bought those, those French comics that I showed last week. I bought them last week. And they were cheap. That's why I bought them. Yeah, cheap is always I, good. Yeah. So three old... I, I've noticed something because there were a lot of those, even though they were published 30 years ago. Uh, and they're, they're warehouse finds. Right. Because... Uh, the, the 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 notion that you can print uh, two hundred copies of a book uh, that's very recent. Right. It wouldn't be, oh the, yeah. The the economics just just weren't there thirty years ago. Right. They they knew they could sell about five hundred copies of those, but they would have to print five thousand. So they'd all be stored in some warehouse somewhere. Right. And then the company would dump them for a one cent a book or or something or the, they would go out of business and so and that's how this uh, bookstore got all of those and it's not yeah. like there were like all of it and they were brand new but they were 30 years old 
Yeah. Well, I can tell you just from printing our black and white comic in 1997 or whenever it was that at uh, Brenner Printing in Texas, the lowest amount you could print was a thousand copies. Mm -hmm. And for the for nearly the same price, you may as well print three thousand copies. Yeah. <laughs> so you did. So I did, which is why I have so many copies of it sitting <laughs> in my garage. So it was like I'm sure that's what everyone did, you know. For when you like you said, you you couldn't print two hundred. You maybe maybe you you think you could sell five hundred of them, but to print five hundred of them is as expensive as printing 5,000, just about. Mm -hmm. Or 3,000 at least. <laughs> yeah, so I can, I can see that's what happened. Definitely. Yeah. And I, I think, think that's where my copies of... Uh... Here we go. Duranco's History of Comics. Mm -hmm. I got these in the early to mid-90s. Perfect condition. And they're from the early... They must have been a warehouse find. I always thought that. They just came into a local comic shop. The guy didn't even order them. I bought them for $6, the price on them from 1972. But well, they must have been sitting in a warehouse since the early 70s. <laughs> and ah, there's someone who disappeared for a while. Do you know the cartoonist Linda Barry? Uh, I think so. She, she, um, here, here, what's this one named? Naked Ladies. She what did she do? She did a comic that was in the Village Voice and other indies curled Ernie Pook's comics. These are all her black and white drawings of uh naked ladies on a deck of cards. But she she was one of those people who um what happened to her. The sometime in like the early 2000s the bottom fell out of like the alternative newspapers here in the USA. Cause are you, that's where, um, what's his name? Uh, Matt Groening from the Simpsons. He used to have life in hell was his cut. And there was, there was a, a good dozen cartoonists who all made good livings from alternative newspapers. Uh, but like then, then the bottom fell out of the market due to the internet or whatever. All the, and it was like all of a sudden, all these cartoonists had no work. And I remember she was one of them. She like disappeared for ten years and nearly went broke. I think she's made it back now, and I think she was teaching. And I, she may have been Canadian. I remember something to do with the Canadian government gave her a grant because they have art grants for cartoonists. But like she was almost destitute for after after being you know pretty famous cartoonist for a while was almost destitute for a long time. It's crazy how that can happen. <laughs> Which you know AI is going to do to all of us soon. <laughs> mm -hmm. But she was one of my favorites. I liked Linda uh, Mar Marley's. I think that was her character. They recently put out a new book of her stuff. I used to buy the Village Voice on occasion just to read the cartoons. Have you ever heard of the Village Voice before? Yeah, uh, I know a lot of the a few indie, indie artists uh, from the sixty from the sixties and uh, appeared in the Village Voice. Yeah, because it was the the hippie the hippie newspaper. Right. They used to get into the streets, and I think they used to give it away. I don't even. You, I think in the nineties it was free on the streets of New York, but you had to pay a dollar for it, like at my local newsstand or something like that. 
Yeah, they, they'd give it. A, they'd give them away because the the potheads didn't have any money left. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was all advertising. As long as your circulation was high, those ad dollars would roll in. They used to have boxes on the street corners of New York where you'd just go get your copy of the Village Voice. I think it was free. Oh, the things I can't remember these days. The everyday things that were taken for granted. I'm going to ask my, I'm gonna have to ask my friends if they remember. On Facebook. <laughs> Some will remember. There were, we had a couple of guys who who did more who were cartoonists, mostly worked on uh, on magazines and newspapers. But every once in a while, well, they, they, they try to do a, a graphic novel or something. <laughs> and, and that was basically just to have one because uh, they make more money doing cartoons. Let's do a Reed Ripper slab. Let's do a Reed Ripper slab. We didn't do one last week. Nope. Because I wouldn't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. What do we got here? Let's look up. I have four left. 1958 May Harvey. Ooh, Harvey. It's comics I've never read. Oh, wrong thing. That's settings. <laughs> I want to present. Share screen. There we go. Harvey hits number 11, Little Audrey. Spooky, number 22. And Little Iodine, number 41. I don't remember Little Iodine. Me neither. Uh... The other two I remember. Did, was, did Spooky appear in Casper? Is he a Casper character? Yeah. I think he's the deadbeat uncle. Uh. Uh, so I'm going to read a little Audrey. Uh, rip Spooky and Slab Little Iodine. Uh -huh. All new, yeah. all brand new stories in Little Iodine. Yeah, but I'm going to Slab it because uh, that one has the... Uh, it's it has the most pop art cover. Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm going to rip Spooky because I don't want to. I don't want to waste time with a comic that's about this uh, a Casper supporting character. <laughs> so let's read a little Audrey and see what uh, all that squawking and squeaking is about. I think she's playing a violin with a bow and arrow bow. Yeah. Oh, because her regular violin bro bow is broken at her feet. I see now. She broke her violin bow, so she went to her archery kit to get her bow and arrow bow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so obviously we're going to replace the bow with the dolphin. See, now I was going to say, obviously, we're going to replace the sandwich with the dolphin. <laughs> a little no, 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 no. The sandwich <laughs> is for the flamingos. <laughs> no, One on each the, side. The flamingos are going to be standing on top of that cloud. Hmm. <laughs> Harvey Comet or a stupid baby. <laughs> Slab Spooky. Read Audrey. Rip Little, <laughs> little Audrey. Uh, uh, rip little iodine, make the dolphin throw them all in the ocean. <laughs> if you had chosen covers from a couple of years later, you would would have found the superheroes that Starenko uh, ah. created for for Harvey Comics, the one with the like Tiger Boy, the one with the the boys facing the tiger's body. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. I think I'm going to slab little Audrey, read little Iodine, and I'm going to rip Spooky, too. Yeah. I wonder if all these covers were by, uh, what's his name, Warren, Warren Kramer? Kramer. Kramer? 
a little Audrey definitely definitely as a as a vibe. A little light I don't think so. Let's see. Yeah, that's got a different style. Light on forty one. So let's go over here. Let's see what sixty two Lefty Blues is doing. He's gonna read Spooky. All right, so at least someone's reading Spooky. Slab little Audrey. Violin turns into the dolphin, and the bow into a flamingo. The the flamingos just stand on the bow. They don't turn so, into anything. <laughs> Little Iodine by Jimmy Hatlow. Also, since it's a Dell comic, that thing must be licensed from, from something. You picked you broke your own rules for this one. That's a because that's that's not a Harvey. Oh, that was not a well they all oh Dell Harvey Harvey well, whatever. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Jimmy Hatlow. Who's Jimmy Hatlow? Okay, born in Providence. 1897. So that guy was old. He, 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 19, he died in 1963. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, the Tech Comics. 1898. Member of the National Little Cartoonist Iodine. Society. Little Iodine kind of looks like bad Gerald McBoing Boing art. I am not sure who that is. Gerald. But she really is hungry for that sandwich. Yep. I don't know how good a shape it's going to be in after she uh, commutes with it, though, in that undersized sandwich case. Yeah, Hathla was a cartoonist, and Little Lionine was the, apparently the only ongoing character. He had something called They'll Do It Every Time. Oh, okay. I know that strip. That was one where, where people would actually write in. It's like, uh, matter of fact, it's a pet peeve strip. Like uh, that writer in um, Little Shark, the, the, they're like, they'll do it every time. You sit down on the train and some guy is playing his mobile video game with the sound on. Yeah. Okay. And then, then, then they'll say, you know, uh, Sent in by uh, Paolo Costa, <laughs> Little Rock, Arkansas. They'll do it every time. Okay, so that spooky doesn't have credits here, but uh, yeah, that looks like Warren Kramer. And, and the Little Audrey doesn't have credits here either. Harvey Hits, number 11. Let's see, cover we go. So Harvey, yeah, I'm saying they're all hits. nice looking covers. Harvey hits at, new, at different characters every every month. So next month it's going to be the Phantom. Ooh. They had the rights to the Phantom around that time. Little Dot's uncles, Herman and Catnip, more Phantom, Wendy, Sad Sex Army Live. Was it a reprint -ish kind of series? I wonder. Mm, no, the, these are new. These are new stories. Yeah. Casper's uh -huh. nightmare. Inventory there. stories. <laughs> Probably. All right. Let's try another one. Let's see here. What else do I have? See if I can go right to here and pick 2014. 2014. We're, we're skipping around. There we go. May Image and Dark Horse. Ooh, I have not read any of these. We've got Bounce number 12, Furious number 5, and Mercenary C and number 4. I know nothing about these. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to. The bounce. Read... Yeah, I'm going to read the bounce because it's by Joe Casey. So Joe I, Casey. I know I can't, I know I can't trust that. And I'm going to rip Furious because that cover is, is like nothing in there makes sense. <laughs> 
or wait a minute, no, I'm going to rip mercenaries here because that's boring. And I'm going to slab furious. <laughs> and I can claim that's art. I was thinking about slab and furious too, because it would just be so ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. How how many slabs of furious number five do you think there are? <laughs> probably not many. Uh, if probably, any. Yeah. But since you're slabbing it, I can't slab it because then there'll be two Furious Number no. Five slabs, and it wouldn't be funny then. That's right. How, how will you be able to to dump yours at at a five hundred percent markup? <laughs> so I'll slab the Mercenary C. Oh, but that's boring. You shouldn't slab that. Don't I'll let you cover. It's okay. Once you look at it a bit, it's okay. No, I, I, I'm going I'm to. I decided I was going to rip it after really taking a look at it. <laughs> I'm going to rip Furious to drive up the price of your slabbed Furious. Thank you. And then I'm going to read the bounce because that's what's left. I don't want to slab that one. Look at that. Cover. Which, that cover's not bad. It's just, you know, a little single figure boring. Mercenary see lessons for six issues. Six issues on the mer who whose names are on that? I can't even tell. Reynolds, Cal Simmons, and Matthew Reynolds. I have no idea who they are. Al Simmons, Cal Simmons. Oh, Cal Simmons. Oh, I I may have read something by him. What was the name of it? Mysterion, the un unfathomable, mysterious, the unfathomable. I don't know if that was him or not, but I may have read that by. Him. Like mysterious, the unfathomable. It was like a magic book from Image kind of thing. That might not have been his right name, but the unfathomable, I think, is right. <laughs> Do you think the bounce is like uh, speedball? Let's see. Oh, what's Tit Goblin going to do? He's going to read Mercenary C, rip Bounce, and slab... Oh, we got two two slabs of Furious now. Yours is worth half it used to be worth. Dolphin the TV screens. <laughs> Down there. Let's see. I can't find out what this is about. Yeah, they don't they don't put synopsis in, in, in the... Got to go to its Wikipedia page or something. I don't know. Does it have one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Let's see. Joe Casey, the balance. But I got to tell you, these uh, ones from the last 10 years or so are the hardest to do. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much stuff. There's so many comics. And you get no idea what they're about from just the covers and titles. The bounce so like stars. If, I, if I've never heard of it, it's just kind of like, huh. Hmm. The bounce stars Jasper Jenkins, just your average twenty-something guy who gained his powers through surreal circumstances. <laughs> when he's not hanging out and doing a lot of nothing, he puts on a costume and hits the street as the bounce, a superhero in a world that's not used to superpower the heroes and villains. Jenkins may be a slacker superhero, but the bounce is loaded with depth. As Casey and Messina explore what would make a person put on a costume and fight crime, the pressures of modern identity politics, and even some good old-fashioned superheroic action. Okay. That's on the Goodreads website. Uh-huh. So finally, Goodreads is good for something. 62 Lefty Blues says, Bounce is meet the ultimate slacker superhero for the 21st century. <laughs> Jasper Jenkins is... A super head and a superhero. <laughs> he's relatable and reliable. He's embarking on the adventure of a lifetime. <laughs> that Mer Tit Goblin says that Mercenary C book seems like something you would check out, Jared. Yeah, that, that I like the cover. That's why I'm slamming that one. So I, I would definitely pick that up and see what it looks like. Uh, from my comic shop, 62 Lefty Blues says. That's where you got the info. <laughs> he's basing me liking <laughs> absolutely nothing 
All right, so let's put a dolphin in there. Uh, the dolphin will be replacing that bridge on the mercenary sea. Since it, so they're walking they over be... a dolphin. Exactly. <laughs> and the flamingos are going on the Furious logo. I'm going to put the uh, flamingos in mercenary C in silhouette with the rest of the people crossing across, except they'll be mm -hmm. pink silhouettes. And I'm doing something a little weird with the dolphin. Mm -hmm. I'm putting him on the bounce cover, but I'm replacing his sort of shoulder and bicep there with the dolphin. <laughs> That would make no sense. <laughs> You're <Okay>. right. <laughs> but it'll fit visually very nicely. His his elbow will be right on the dolphin's nose with his, you know, forearm and hand coming out of it. Mm -hmm. I think that'll work. How do you pick your read, rip, and slab choice screens? What I do is I go to Mike's Amazing World Comics and see what came out that month. And then I just look through and try to come up with some kind of theme. And, and I also try to pick comics that are sort of of equal value in anything. I try not to pick, you know... And I try not to pick anything obvious, like, you know, Hulk 181 in with a bunch of other comics where everybody would slab Hulk 181. Why wouldn't you? Or to put, you know, a classic Spider-Man story in with two unknown comics. Of course, you're going to want to, you know, I try to make, I try to even everything out, make them all sort of equally interesting or uninteresting. <laughs> So that, that's how I end up picking them. Just kind of go, huh. Now I have to make some more up. Oh, one more book I got this week. The last one, I think. This was at Mocha Fest. Beta Testing the Ongoing Apocalypse. And this is by Tom Kaczynski, who is the publisher of Uncivilized Books. And this, I think, is a collection of his futuristic short stories, which have, I think, it's a lot due to the duo, duo tone, the two color printing, black and green. Looks a lot like Daniel Klaus in places. Because Daniel Klaus uh, did a lot of stuff like that. But the art style doesn't necessarily always look like that. But he also gave me uh, a remark drawing, that sinking feeling. He drew this right as I was standing there. And the description is, what does it say here? At once science fiction, contemporary demonology, and occult theory, a mutant utopia, and an architectural treatise, Beta Testing the Ongoing Apocalypse is a series of fictions about the contemporary global megalopolis. Tom Kaczynski's short stories trace a complex space-time trajectory from the smallest corporate cubicle out to the farthest phantoms of the multiverse. If that gives you any idea what this is about, you're one step ahead of me. <laughs> Well, listen, I flipped through it and liked the artwork. Nice guy smoking at a smoking in his car illustration. So these those, those were the these are the three books I bought at the uncivilized table. Mm -hmm. Damnation Diaries, Evil Eyes C, and Beta Testing the Ongoing Apocalypse. Seventy dollars those cost me. You could spend a lot of money at Mocha Fest. A lot of cool stuff there. Mm -hmm. They even had um 
drawing, what are they, uh, like Wacom tablet drawing for drawing, except not Wacom. Some other company had set up shop there. You could go over and they had about, I don't know, half a dozen tablets hooked up to computers, I guess, that you could go over and draw on and test out. Ooh. And a lot of individual artists. Good stuff. A good show. It was the first time I've meant to go to that for like 10 years, which I <laughs> never have. So I was happy to finally go. And the students all had a good time for the first time facing the public and trying to sell some of their stuff. Because the students all had prints and stickers and all sorts of stuff to sell. And covers matter. Yep. Well, that's what that's what we've been saying for for years. Yeah, and we've had people doing. Oh, why don't the covers don't mean anything? It's just I, nice covers. I notice. Um, do I have? Uh, let me show one eight hundred ghosts. Let me see if I can find my copy of it here. Ah, crap! I don't know where I put it. <laughs> Oh, there it is. This is 1-800 Ghosts by G. Davis Cathcart. Um, this is a Fantagraphics printing, but he public, he teaches over at Pratt now. Um, and he teaches, uh, and he published this first as a mini comic. So he had his mini comic in with a bunch of stuff at the Pratt table. And this, like, the mini comic cover was a little bit different than this. But this sort of op art cover caught everybody's eye who walked past. Everybody who walked past our booth stopped and looked at his 1 800 Ghosts. Uh, I was amazed because I was standing in front of our booth a lot of time in my jacket <laughs> drawing people yeah. over. But for but, the first no. time, a a title in the in the center of the cover works. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, th this whole op art thing really it really drew people in. Yeah, it, it would catch everybody's eye. It, 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 it reminds kind of me a little, of a little display, mm -hmm. and it was the most eye catching thing in that display. So and, pe and it caught people's eye. I was like, whoa. And it reminds me of a vinyl record cover. It reminds you of what? A vinyl record cover. Yeah, yeah. But I got to say, I was, I was, um, like I said, I, I noticed it. I was just like, wow, everybody, everybody came up and looked at that. And I saw, you know, half a dozen people buy it over the day. So it was definitely, definitely a lesson in have a cover that's eye catching. <laughs> Get people in there. Because it's 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 tough. Uh, there was there was one woman right nearby us who I talked to briefly, who um, she looked like she was in a picture frame. She she was just a, a a sort of lone artist having a little table, and she was standing up behind her table, and had kind of a frame around her where the outside of the frame was a bunch of prints and stuff and had a little decorative edge on it. And she was standing in the middle of it. I should have taken a picture. So I was taking all sorts of pictures there. I never took a picture of her. And she she looked like a she was standing in a framed painting. I was kind of like, oh that's that's eye catching. <laughs> uh. There's my Mocha Fest badge still on my table since I've had a cold since Wednesday night and haven't cleaned anything up. Do you keep your badges from conventions you attend as a guest? I have. I think I stuck them in some box somewhere. Uh, I don't know I where a, they are right now. Yeah, I have a bunch of badges from sports events the, that I attended as a journalist. Yeah. I kept about 95% of them, and the ones I didn't keep... 
I lo- I know I lost them. It's not I, I didn't throw any away. The the ones from from uh, media presentations I usually throw away because they're more generic. Right. They just say the Mercedes, and they have my <laughs> name on it. It's a name tag. I don't need yeah. it. Yeah. But I have about 150. Wow. That's a lot of them. That's quite a collection. Yeah. I've got about six. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if I, they might be somewhere around here. <laughs> I haven't seen uh, them in a while. Occasionally they'll run across one and go, oh, yeah, look at that. I've seen music professionals uh, being interviewed in their studio. Uh, and having a place where where there's a a, b- a bunch of passes and name tags <laughs> hanging from, so you're from like, the that's circles. cool. I'm gonna do that. <laughs> no, I, no. Uh, I noticed that he was doing the same thing because I I keep them the same way. <laughs> <laughs> You've got them all hanging around a central post kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Actually, let me see if I let me see if I can pick up some of them. Just He'll to take show off. For, a ra- for a walk. Oh, no, no, we're not going for a walk. Going I'm just going to pick him up. Yeah, I'm going for a walk. And, send- and I can take. He's finding us those badges. Yeah, just three or four, I guess. Uh... Yeah. It's pretty stout. Yeah, just three or four. Just the best ones he's gonna pick out. No, there. not even that. Uh, I've grabbed some. They're, they're all they're all stuck together. Ah. Uh, if we if we hear all of a sudden here ah and something falls to hear something crashing down, we'll know they all fell on him. Yeah. <laughs> like a bookshelf. Ah. Yeah, they're not on the bookshelf. <laughs> okay, let's see what we have here. All right, so this is my racing weekend batch from uh-huh. 2014. Uh, 2014. 2014, yeah. So that's for the while. National, yeah, it's for the National Circuit Racing Championship. Uh huh. So I could attend every race with the same badge. Wow. Because it's the circuit. Yep. Ooh, this one's nice. Uh, this one was when I was invited to go to the do by 24 hours because the winner of the Nissan GT Academy contest contest was Portuguese and he was going to do his pro- first professional race. Uh huh. So th- this is for Friday. Sweet this for three. Saturday. This is for Saturday, yeah. Don't try using Friday's badge on Saturday, people. They won't. That's right. In. Exactly. Uh, acceleration 14. Oh, this was fun. Uh, one of the worst championships of all time. They were going to do a media, a music festival uh, in a ra- in a racing event. Huh. Uh, after three races, they stopped having music, huh. and then 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 uh, there were two races where they didn't have races, only music. Huh. <laughs> uh, but the they hired David Hasselhoff to be the the spokesman. <laughs> uh, it was a bunch of Dutch guys that 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 had too much money to to spend and, and organize this, but it, this was terrible. Yeah. Okay, this is from an Opel media presentation, so pretty standard. It doesn't even have the car in it. This. Okay, so that that media pass for the Dubai twenty four hours was for the suite. This is the actual media pass. Ah, okay. So who whoever you worked for had a suite, and you could go to the suite no, and relax. No, and... no, the the we were invited by Nissan, and and they had the that suite. Okay, so Nissan had the suite. Yeah. But then to get cool. everywhere else, you needed the media yeah. pass. Mm-hmm. This is from European Le Mans series, four hours Estoril in 2016. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, oh, here it, tell, it tells you what I can do, where I can uh-huh. and where I can go. So paddock and, and media center. I can 
I can't do. I couldn't go to the hospitality lounges <laughs> or the TV compound or the pit lane. But I could go on a pit lane. Nobody, no, nobody would complain. Tit Goblin asks, Jared, have you ever thought about renting a table at a place like that? Um, I well, we did back in like the late nineties when my friends and I were self-published our own comic. Lexus ES. Uh, the schedule on the back. <laughs> and right. uh, it was kind of a nightmare at times, but it was all right. But um, my friend who used to work with at Marvel, Randy Gentile, who um, has been putting out his own comics for the last few years, too. He, he put out a Charles Manson comic. He put a couple other things. But right now, he's working on a comic called The Agony of the Ecstasy. I think uh, Lazy Comics is the name of his Instagram. But he's just been posting some of the panels from his new um, Agony of Ecstasy being a cartoonist, which is you know about his life doing cartooning. And one of the things he's talking about is, is tabling at a con and how the first time he did it, because, you know, I don't even know what, 10, 15 years ago, because everybody said, you have to table at a con, you have to do this, you have to do that. So he decided to table at a con. And like he's a slice of life cartoonist. He's not really a Marvel DC guy, so nobody cared he was there. And the guy who had the table next to him was doing balloon animals. So he got <laughs> to watch the balloon animal guy all weekend. And people were more interested in the balloon animal guy than him in his work. So he was just like <laughs> totally put off from cons. <laughs> so that I had to tell you that just because uh, I heard it. But, but I, I, I tabled with cons at tons of back in the late 90s when I was... Uh, selling stuff doing our self-publishing our comic but ever since then i just go and it's a social occasion for me <laughs> i go and visit people and talk to people i got i got nothing to sell them so i have not what does this say? I bet he has them meticulously organized. <laughs> yeah, does this, this, this look like meticulously organized? <laughs> that, that's how they were, and that's how I pick them up. And that's what I, where I'm going to put them back. <laughs> uh, I just found another. I, I was. Um, I told you, um, Michael Kreger, I had uh, met at Mocha Fest, uh, who I know. And about his comic, The Zone, that was in Dark Horse Presents and had one issue, uh, a one shot from Dark Horse sometime in the late 90s. Well, I, I was going to show that comic off on my hall, on my mocha hall that I did earlier in the week. Except I couldn't find it. I went to the went to my database, looked it up, went to where it was supposed to be, and it's not there. So I'm like, uh-oh, I Raiders of the Lost Ark to another comic. <laughs> I have no idea where the sick where the one issue of the zone is because it's not under independent comics Z. So where is it? I don't know. I'll have to buy another copy of it just so I can look at it. I'm sure it's not too expensive at uh, mycomicshop.com if they have it. But I like how I can Raiders of the Lost Ark something. Just like, oh, it's here somewhere, but it's misfiled, so it may, I may as well not have it. <laughs> hmm. Do you think Wilson's back uh, from watching Ghostbusters? <laughs> Good question. Probably not. He probably went to a eight o'clock show hmm. at you know the earliest, I would guess. So he's probably right in the middle of watching the Ghostbusters. <laughs> and I'll predict his review right now. It was okay. <laughs> because that's the average review for everybody for the average movie. It was okay. I watched a couple, a few, a few spaghetti westerns uh, on TV this week. The Sabata movies uh, with uh, Lee Van Cleef, Lee Van Cleef on one and three, and Yul Brynner on number on two. 
<laughs> Funny thing, leaving Cliff, leaving Cliff was not available to do the second Sabata because <laughs> he was busy doing the the fourth uh, Magnificent Seven. After Yul <laughs> Brynner uh, declined to do the fourth Magnificent Seven, but he had already not done the third one. So the Magnificent Seven, it, 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 it's it's a it's an early example of uh, franchise fatigue. Because the first yeah. one's a, the first one's amazing, the second one is okay, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. The the third one is useless, and, and the and the fourth one is a an insult to people's intelligence. Wow, I didn't even know they did more than two. Yeah. Well, well, it used to be, and this could be seen in the Planet of the Apes too. At that time. You always gave the sequel half the budget of the original. Mm -hmm. That's why they got worse and worse over time. Um, good thing they stopped doing that when they realized they could make even more money with the second movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's why everything is franchises now. They they're like, yeah. hey, we don't have to advertise this movie as much because everybody knows of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, the, they go down. Planet of the Apes, the, the fourth and fifth, are definitely the worst ones. <laughs> that that reminds just... me of uh, my friend John always used to laugh at this. He always used to mention it. I think it was Michael Caine couldn't be there to be on the Oscars for his Oscar for, I think it was Hannah and her sisters, because he was too busy making Jaws 3. <laughs> My friend John always laughed at that every time he mentioned that story. Mm. More important things to do. <laughs> and a heart to you too, Kitty Acidity. <laughs> She'll be right back. Well, we won't be. We're yeah. fortunately we'll be signing off. Uh it's the end of our show. I'm glad I made it through with mm -hmm. this cold. Yeah. I can feel my uh, my nose starting to clog up and run at the same time. <laughs> Police Academy 17 had a budget of Subway <laughs> Sandwich Value Card. There we go. On uh, that joke, we'll end and we'll leave you with some balloons. There we go. You guys have a good week out there. And we'll catch you. Any last words for us, Paolo? Well, I'll think of something after after we sign off. Okay. <laughs> the spirit of the staircase will hit him in a few minutes. So we'll catch you guys next time.